So this one is about a company called TVS Motors. This is the third largest two-wheeler manufacturer in the country. They're about 11,000 crores uh, worth in revenues. And they kind of make a whole lot of bikes from, you know, the, the heavy-duty TVS XL moped to you know, racing-inspired bikes like the Apache and stuff. But again, you're not talking about bikes today, are we? We're talking about nature. And uh, this talk is essentially about how this company is trying to put nature back into focus. They're trying to see how uh, they can balance off development along with, uh, you know, uh, sustaining nature as well. This journey started about a year back and uh, yeah, Rana and Sugandhi who are in the audience have been part of this journey, as much a part of this journey as me. I'm just being the messenger over here. Um, so when last February we got a call saying, you know, would you like to kind of come and document a heronry? And uh, we were like, okay, what, what, what's the background about this heronry? And we were told that this is, hap this is within a corporate organization. Uh, having worked in corporate for a while, all of us were a little bit skeptical about the whole thing because we've seen people having one plant and one bird sitting on it and calling that off as a bird park, right? And uh, we were like, okay, let's go and have a look at it. Let's try to understand if it is more serious than that and not just some PR exercise, right? And uh, we landed up at the company. And of course, like most corporates and stuff, beautiful lawns, pre-lined avenues, and things like that. So a lot of familiar sites. But as we walk to the end of the road, we come across this. And this was a very fascinating place. There were hundreds of birds out there. A lot of painted stalks in different stages of breeding and nesting. We counted about 100 of them that morning. We came across a whole tree full of pelicans. There were about 140 of them, again, on, on the very first day that we were there. And a whole bunch of other birds. There were about maybe about 60 or 70 gray herons. They were egrets, cormorants, night herons. It was, the whole place was buzzing with activity. So you know, as we were kind of taking in this, taking in this entire scene, the, the factory alarm kind of went off. And uh, you know, that's when we, we came back to our senses. We looked around. And this is what we saw. Uh, less than about 100 meters from where the birds were, the employees were coming out. They were having their morning chai. And it was all, in some sense, there was this entire sense of harmony. So the birds weren't even disturbed. Not a single wing was flapped. Right? At the same time, the, the employees were silent. They were kind of not crossing an invisible line. And all this was happening within about 100 meters of each other. Right? So this kind of impressed us quite a bit. Then we said, OK, so what else? What else is out here? And we kind of walked around the place. And we walked through these beautiful young forests uh, inside the company. Uh, these are forests maybe about a decade old. They've all been apparently planted by hand. And we walked through these carpets of fallen flowers. We saw a whole bunch of stuff from spiders to uh, butterflies, birds. We in fact saw a mongoose run right across the path as well. This was all kind of fairly interesting and kind of our skepticism or our shield kind of started withdrawing. Of course, that's a, that skepticism was taken over by this guy sitting in one of the uh, uh, watchtowers, and he was looking at us very suspiciously as, what, what are these guys doing at all? All this was kind of very impressive, and we kind of saw that there's a whole lot of thing happening. The one question, of course, that we had was, is this a coincidence, or is there something that is actively being done here? Right, so we kind of went back. We had a chat uh, uh, with the vice president of the civil department. And we kind of came across a lot of very interesting things. So as per policy, uh, in all their plants, the company leaves aside 30% of their area for green areas. So out of that, about half of it is left aside for ponds and uh, forested areas, which is about 50 acres in the, uh, in the Hosur plant where we did this work. So this was kind of fairly fascinating. And we, we in fact, walked through a, a whole lot of that. And the other very interesting thing is this is something that's driven right from the top. So the chairman, in fact, Apparently says that this 15% is my land. The other 85, the other 70% uh, is what you take care, you do, you build profits, you do whatever for the investors. Don't touch my 15%. And so they have a master plan that outlines what is the areas that can be developed, or factories can be built. What are the areas that have to be left alone? And there are a whole lot of other stuff, very simple things like they don't use pesticides in any of their gardens or in their lawns or any of the thing. They don't. They have an active policy not to harm any animals including stuff like snakes that come into their property and things. We'll talk about that in a little bit of time. So that was kind of fairly interesting, because this kind of puts a structure to the whole thing. And um, as we kind of went along the project, which I'll talk about in a bit, we kind of started realizing a lot of this is actually being implemented, and a lot more is being done than, uh, than just the basic policy. 
So we kind of started discussing as to how to showcase this. Um, and of course, the heronry uh, where all the painted stocks and all were breeding was the flagship. So any visitor who would come to the factory from uh, anywhere across the world would first be taken there. So that was obviously something that they want to showcase to the entire world. But then we said, look, there's, there's so much more out there. It's not just the birds. There's these beautiful forests. There's a whole lot of diversity which possibly people won't even look at. So why don't we actually go ahead and showcase that to the, uh, you know, to, to the outside world? That idea kind of went, uh, you know, they, they kind of liked the idea and stuff. So we said, let's do it over all the seasons. So let's look at the breeding uh, at the summer uh, for the breeding season of all the birds. Let's look at the monsoon because that's the time of abundance. That's the time when most of the smaller creatures come out. And then let's look at the winters because we get a lot of winter migrants in India, right? We get a lot of birds that migrate here in uh, in winter. So with that, we said that kind of completes the entire story. We're not just focusing on one aspect, but let's try to build an entire story around this. And that thing actually went off well. So we said let's. So we started off working on that and. Our first stop was, of course, the same, the very same pond that we went on the very first day. This is very close to their R&D center. So we, we, we started working here, and one of the things we realized is this pond was originally built around the early 1980s for water, rainwater harvesting. And it was a simple pond that was built just to collect water. But when they started seeing a lot of life around it, they've actually planted a whole lot of trees. So there are about 10 to 12 species of trees that have been planted all around to provide purchase for the birds. And uh, they kind of created the islands and stuff to kind of build, create the heronry. So that's, of course, attracting a lot of birds, right? Like the, the painted stock is, of course, the flagship of the heronry as such. And there's about this year, they had about 156 birds nesting over there. So we documented everything from the painted stocks nesting. So their arrival, their nesting, and to the times the young ones kind of come out, the young ones are kind of trying to find a foothold. And eventually, all the adults leave, and the pond is only full of all the juveniles. And so we kind of documented this entire cycle of the bird. Now, one of the questions we had is, since this is a fairly young pond, uh, you know, how, 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 how are these birds finding the food? That's, again, one place where the company kind of intervenes. So they kind of bring in fish from the local fisheries, uh, from the local fisheries department. And they keep feeding the pond from time to time so that there's enough food for the birds. So that also kind of brings in a lot of other birds like pot-billed pelicans. Of course, the pelicans have been congregating there in great numbers, still not ne started nesting over there. There's a whole lot of gray herons. So we counted about 78 of the birds this year. Uh, there was a whole lot of darters as well. So at one point, we could see 16 darters in a pond that's about one and a half acres. This was one of the other cute sites that we kind of came across one of the days. So this was this whole gang of ducklings along with the mother. Of course, when there's so many young ones around the pond, of course, they're bound to be predators as well. Right, so there's this local Brahmini kite that kind of hangs around the pond, picks up fish, picks up young birds. And the thing is because it's it's a very small area and it's kind of very close to where humans are, we kind of work from a hide and we keep getting visitors outside the hide like the uh, Indian flap shell turtles or even visitors like the day gecko sometimes inside our hides. Now, of course, some of these visitors can also bite pretty hard like checkered keelbacks that kind of hang around the place. We kind of documented a whole lot of snakes around the place and one of the things, so when we presented, when we did our first presentation to the chairman, uh, he was like, you know, why don't you actually do an entire chapter on snakes? We were a little taken aback because, you know, why, why would you want us to do a chapter on snakes when, you know, people are normally a little afraid? So he kind of went on to kind of say that, look, snakes are extremely misunderstood. You know, these are things which uh, you know, you need to kind of figure out how to kind of live with them because they kind of take care of a whole lot of things in terms of pest control or things like that. And they have these boards all over the factory, actually. There are about four or five of these boards across the factory which says don't kill snakes. And that despite the fact that they have all the big four snakes. So they have uh, the vipers, both the vipers, they have the crate, they have the uh, spectacle cobra within the campus. So from time to time, of course, these snakes keep getting into the factory or in close contact with the people working there. So whenever a snake kind of comes in, they have a dedicated team of security guards. So these guys know how to rescue snakes, how to relocate them. So they kind of immediately come in, they pick up the snakes, they leave it in the forest areas. So it's all kind of, in some sense, a well-orchestrated system overall of how to kind of avoid conflict. Because why are snakes there? Snakes are there because there's a whole abundance of other stuff. You know, there's a whole lot of frogs uh, that we see, especially in the monsoons. Like we see them everywhere, you know, from the water to the trees to, you know, even underground. We came across these ballooned 
a marble balloon frog you know when they were kind of digging up for some industrial activity and these guys just kind of came out we kind of figured out about nine species of frogs here and yeah sometimes we had to kind of get into these awkward positions to shoot some of them because we wanted to ensure that we shoot them in their natural habitats rather than kind of trying to you know bring them out and take a shot and leave it back although it's such a small forest the whole abundance of life that we kind of came across and the fig trees of course were um, kind of one of those reservoirs of life in some sense from the birds to the frogs to the snakes and stuff whole lot of flora as well over there i think about 195 species of trees have been documented including the ones they have planted whole lot of fungi as well especially in the monsoons and profusion of smaller forms of life right like the uh, uh, the bugs that kind of come out at that time we were ants kind of carrying away spiders so speaking of spiders actually one of the interesting things we came across in this and one of the things that actually kind of completely um, you know made us spellbound was this this actually stumped us literally and this is a tree stump spider and we were kind of just walking by one of the bamboos by mistake we touched one of the bamboo uh, uh, branches and we saw this web kind of just kind of going down like that with a twig at the end and the twig started climbing up by itself and you're like what what what's happening here and then we kind of saw that this is this guy this tiny little one which goes and sits at the junction of the bamboos and just kind of disappears completely so once we lose it if we kind of look down to change our camera settings we look up it takes us 5 minutes to find this guy again he's like that well camouflaged overall there's a whole lot of birds as well as in from on bills to fly catchers to a whole lot of grassland birds the rollers and prinias and babblers of course the shikra acting as a sentinel for the factory as well a whole lot of butterflies a lot of flowering plants all around the place obviously a whole lot of butterflies coming in a whole lot of dragonflies and damselflies as well in some sense we kind of found that there is a good ecosystem that's out there and this is right in the middle of the factory and everything is thriving very well over there this was in fact right next to a building right so the termites were coming out one evening right next to the factory building from the road that's actually the road out there and of course there were birds ready to catch them the evenings of course has always been an interesting thing especially in the winters because huge number of starlings as in you've seen rosy starlings chestnut tail starlings forming murmurations flying all over the company you know as people start leaving the company at sunset you see these whole lot of birds flying around and this is again one of the interesting anecdotes over there so there is a there are a couple of lines of trees where all these birds go and nest and this is right outside one of the factory buildings from where the bikes come out for testing now so many birds mean so much of droppings right and um, a lot of drivers started complaining saying that the roads becoming very slippery you know we're not able to balance the bikes let's just cut off the trees like you know so that the birds can find another perch somewhere so they kind of thought i don't think you know cutting the trees is a good solution let's look at something else so a very simple thing of just putting a shed kind of a thing so that the droppings fall on that and the road is kind of absolutely safe the so simple solutions again geared towards protecting nature rather than you know trying to uh, you know take shortcuts and stuff as well because night is a very different question altogether right and night is the time when a lot of uh, things come out, uh, come out just like the frogs so of course we had a whole bunch of owls we've documented three species of owls we've heard one of them geckos hunting on the barks you have a whole lot of bats and of course this was i think the star of the night for us as and we came across a whole bunch of slender lorises on our walks we kept hearing them at different places we came across three or four of them on the walks it's kind of pretty interesting because for such a small area having such a good density of them was kind of struck us as something very exciting so some of the things is a lot of the mammals at night kept disappearing so we used to see jungle cats but at a flash they would kind of just disappear so we kind of put up a few basic camera traps to kind of understand the diversity of the place so we came across things like this jungle cat which had two kittens so that's one of the kittens sitting right next to the camera trap we came across mongooses with uh, young ones we came across civets it it was kind of fairly interesting but i think the most interesting thing was left for the last just about a few days before we finished this entire exercise this is what we got on one of the camera traps it's a pangolin and apparently to our surprise we actually realized that the uh, the guards at the entry gate have been seeing these animals walking in and out of the gate right at 3 o'clock in the night this suddenly there's some weird creature walking in and walking out and they were like what is this so this was a very 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 exciting discovery to kind of sum it up person we kind of went through we kind of did a whole lot of um, photography we did a whole lot of surveys to understand what is there and this is what uh, we've been able to document about 105 species of birds and a whole lot of butterflies and snakes and frogs and trees so in some sense it's kind of the proof of the pudding as in there's been a whole lot of activity that 
TVS has been doing in conserving nature and stuff. And I think one of the things that they also do very well is to take this out to people. So they have a whole lot of the local uh, school kids coming in from time to time. And they come in, they are oriented towards what is there in the, uh, in the forest areas and things. They also have a whole lot of nature lovers coming in. They kind of come in, they give suggestions and stuff. Of course, as any organization would do, they have a whole lot of other measures as well to kind of look at sustainable practices from solar roofing to waste management to uh, water treatment, nurseries and stuff like that. And from their manufacturing stuff, of course, there's a whole lot of innovation that goes into you know, uh, increasing fuel economy and uh, reducing the pollution, ensuring that most of their bikes are about 85% recyclable and things like that. But I think at the end of the day, the whole thing is that they've kind of made an effort to, in some sense, balance off or try to start balancing off nature with development. So there's a whole lot of activity that's happening, but there's also a whole lot of awareness among the company. Like, I'd like to end with this one anecdote, which is something we have heard so many times. So apparently, if a vehicle is leaking a little bit of oil, the driver stops there and gets that thing fixed immediately because he knows the oil is going to go into the ground, it's going to affect the water table, it's going to impact the birds. Right? So apparently that's the kind of awareness that's been built into this company. So on that note, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Venkateshan who, from uh, TVS. He's the vice president of the civil department. Uh, and Mr. Preston, who's been advising them on uh, a whole lot of natural history. Uh, Good morning to everyone of you. We really thank one and all for inviting us and being, being part of this group. We are really very happy. Uh, Sriram has told most of the story, but I would like to take this opportunity to compliment my chairman, Mr. Venu Srinivasan. He himself is a naturalist, extremely passionate about the nature, and he would like to set standards how a nature and industry can live together a holistic living. So with all his guidance, we started around 15, 20 years back. And we realized that with little intervention and without any disturbance, the nature is ready to give a lot to us. So that is what is this uh, success story in Hosur plant. We never know that we have so much of a living species along with us. Till we got Preston, Sriram, Rana and Sugandhi team. Almost one and a half years non-stop they worked in all season and explored many features, hundreds of them living with us. So I would like to thank all of them. And uh, few of you have already visited us, like Subhu sir, Karthik, Mr. Azad Raghumani, and uh, Mr. Kavle. I would like to take this opportunity. All of you, please visit us. Please encourage us. Give us more ideas. <laughs> we have around 28 campuses across this country. We would like to take this success story horizontally deploy in every campus. Also, we are open for other corporates to visit us and whatever we know, we are ready to share and have a cross learning on this. I would like to again thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, uh, I have been asked by the company to help them enhance the forests that the chairman has, is so keen on. Mr. Venus Srinivasan uh, is one person, is an industrialist who is passionate about nature. And that's the reason he sacrifices some 15%, 30% of his factory land to nature, of which 15% has to be wild forest. That's a mandate that has come from the chairman, and it is practiced by the company everywhere, by all the factories that, can, that have space. And, uh, the, the, the thing to remember is that 50 acres, for example, in the Hosu plant, there's 50 acres under forest. 50 acres is a huge area. You can put up uh, any number of factory buildings and increase productivity by, the, by that much, increase income, increase the, the factory's name, and do so much on those 50 acres of land. But those 50 acres have been set aside 
for forests, for nature. That is something that we all have to appreciate because it looks like in our urban scenario, you know, everywhere in fact, nature is being pushed out. Even in our forest lands, nature is being pushed out. And there's very little that we are offering towards nature in this, in this respect. We're taking and not giving. Even land that doesn't belong to us, land that belongs to nature is being taken away, usurped, and used for our own purposes. So it's high time we started sharing. And this is one fantastic way in which to share. If we can't do it on our own, we can at least do it in, in, a, in, in the form of a group. If, uh, I'm, and I'm hoping, we're hoping, that other companies which have this kind of land will share their land with wildlife because it looks like factories and industries may be the last resorts for urban wildlife. There's going to be no other place for them very shortly. Hopefully, this trend that our chairman has started, that the company has started, will percolate and spread amongst others. Even if you don't have a company, if you have a little space in your backyard, in your garden, in your resort, in your any place that you might have, please try and think about sharing it with wildlife. Very often we go into places and build our homes there. We're actually taking land away from wildlife. If we can, we, we can't give it back to them perhaps, but maybe we can share it with them. So what we're saying is share the world with wildlife as our company is doing. Thank you. Thanks again.